The Artist Life Podcast is brought to you by Real Creative Heart. Heavy the head that reps the crown. With love, your greatness is found. So rep your crown. Live from Greensboro, North Carolina, Art is Life. Welcome to the Art is Life podcast with your host, Russell C. Holt, where we sit down with artists from all career fields and we discuss their perspectives on their art and what it means to them in life. So sit back, have fun, and enjoy the ride. Hey guys, thank you for joining me on another episode of Arts is Life. This would technically be the third season now, uh, first episode of third right. season. Um, and I am joined today with a, another teacher. She was actually my instructor of record. I was her teacher's assistant when I first started here at school um, for introduction of acting or fundamentals of acting, as they call it, fundies. Um, and she is a teacher and a director specializing in music theater a musical theater well mm-hmm. music theater what is music theater it <laughs> but, is. It's, it's music theater <laughs> but, <laughs> no one's ever comes like that. <laughs> but yeah so um oh but yeah so like i was saying yeah i'm joined today with her and she we're gonna get a little insight on that side of the performance um area and then directing as well and choreography all that good stuff so ladies and gentlemen i'd like to introduce you to miss erin spear hi everybody how's it going yes thank you for joining me absolutely um so for those who don't know um just wanted to give a little bit of background about yourself and how you got to this place to up to this point absolutely so i grew up in los angeles california so I'm one of the rare artists who actually was born there. Mm. Uh, I've got my Dodgers hat on actually today. So there you go. Nice. Go Dodgers. Um, yeah, die hard. Uh, so I grew up in Los Angeles uh, in a family of athletes, mm. actually. Um, and here I came and I came out wanting to dance and sing and perform and spent my childhood bossing my sister and my cousins and my friends around. Um, because it turns out that I was always kind of a director. Like Mm. I had vision. I think at that young age, I didn't know how to express that. And so I just like made people do things. Mm -hmm. Um, but I had vision and ideas and, um, kind of understood how to create, I guess, with, uh, with bodies Mm -hmm. in space. Right. So, um, but I was a dancer for a long time. My mom likes to tell a crazy story about me going into the ballet studio at like two and a half and being like, I'm going to be a ballerina. (laughs) And the teacher was like, come back when you're three. And it was my third birthday. And mom said I came out in my leotard and was like, it's my birthday. Let's go dance. (laughs) Um, And that's kind of where it started for me. Um, I booked my first choreography job totally by accident um, at 18 years old. My first like paid choreography job nice. uh, doing a production of Meet Me in St. Louis, um, mm. which is a lovely film. It's a very long musical. It's unnecessarily long. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, didn't know what I didn't know, which was kind of lovely uh, because I just got to figure it out. And mm. I had been watching musicals my whole life and had such like a well of information that I didn't, I don't even think I knew I had, Mm -hmm. but I understood style and I understood um, uh, different like periods and what we would call vernacular jazz and and things like that. And I just had this like huge reference book of of musicals Mm -hmm. (laughs) in my head. Uh, And so I just started figuring things out. I'm so thankful that footage I think doesn't exist for most of those Mm -hmm. because I would probably be horrified at my like early work if I saw it now. (laughs) Um, But I just got to try stuff, throw things against the wall and see what stuck. Um, But I ended up doing under my undergraduate degree. I left Los Angeles and I went to the University of Michigan um, and I earned my BFA in acting there. I think at that point I'd already figured out that I was actually a director Mm -hmm. um, and I really wanted to have a strong foundation in acting and actor techniques and I I was an actor I worked as an actor for quite some time 
Um, but I got my undergraduate degree and then I ultimately ended up back home in Los Angeles where I was doing a ton of choreography and directing. I was auditioning all the time. I was performing at Disneyland. I was like doing all these things. Um, I took a creative hiatus for a few years. I ended up marrying another artist and he is a landscape photographer. That's his heart song. And so, uh, he got an artist in residence job on a ranch in Wyoming, right outside of Yellowstone, spent two years taking a creative hiatus uh, and kind of chasing such a great opportunity and dream for him. And I'm exceptionally thankful that we did that um, because it gave me time to really figure out what I wanted to be focusing on and and uh, if this thing that I'd been doing my whole life was actually what I wanted to do or if I had just kept doing it because that's what I'd always done. Right. Turned out it was really actually what I wanted to do. And I'm not really well suited for much else, if we're being honest. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but directing and choreographing musicals, I think. Yeah. Uh, and we ended up in Orlando, Florida at the end of that time um, for several reasons. But that was where things really kind of took off for me. I was doing a ton of like indie film as an actor and I was doing a lot of commercial work. Um, I booked a couple of big national spots while I was there, uh, and that's where I kind of got back into performance. I was doing a bunch of regional theaters mm -hmm. while I was there, and that's where I made some connections. And what ended up happening is I ended up getting my first adjunct teaching job as a college professor at Florida Southern College, teaching tap and then uh, later modern dance in their musical theater program. Um, and I found out that that's actually what I really love to do is work with college age students in like pre-professional programs. Um, and so I finally went back, I got my MFA at Penn State. There's an MFA in directing for the musical theater there. It's the only one of its kind in the world. They take two people every two years and I am very fortunate <laughs> that I got in. Yeah. Uh, one of my heroes was the head of that program. She just recently retired. Um, Susan H. Shulman, who was the first female director nominated for a Tony nice. Award for directing a musical on Broadway. Um, one of my lifetime heroes, and she's now my mentor, which is awesome. And at the end of that time, I got to make my Broadway debut assisting Christopher Ashley on Escape to Margaritaville. Um, he had just won the Tony Award for his work on Come From Away. Mm -hmm. um, I'd still, to this day, I think my favorite project I've ever seen. Oh, yeah. Come From, come yeah, from come Away. From away. Yep. Mm -hmm. my fa it's my favorite musical. Um, and I was like, I've got to work with that team. And the next project was the Jimmy Buffett show, mm -hmm. uh, which is actually very appropriate for me. <laughs> we spend a lot of time scuba diving and all my free time. Uh, I try to go to the islands or be in the Caribbean somewhere warm with warm water and pretty fish. Yes. Uh, so it turns out Escape to Margaritaville was my Broadway debut. And after uh, that, I got to do the pre-Broadway tour and then the Broadway um, rehearsal process through opening. And then uh, I flew around the country. I interviewed at different jobs and uh, got to choose where I wanted to be. I was very fortunate. And I chose UNC Greensboro, where I've been building the musical theater program with Dominic Amendum, who I think you've yes. interviewed on this podcast yes. already. I'm um, very lucky to get to be here and to work with him and to get to work with some amazing students. So here we are. Uh, that's the very long <laughs> version of the story, but I think I, the it, pieces yes. I think are important to understanding yes. my journey. Yes, makes yeah. makes sense for sure. Yeah. So, when you approached the musical theater, so you you went to you got your BFA in acting. Mm -hmm. What made what did I don't I'm not sure if you said a distinct reasoning for going to the path of musical theater strictly versus acting. Mm -hmm. Like what what drew you more towards musical theater. I know you said you were a dancer and choreography, mm -hmm. I'm assuming was the, the st was the start of yeah. it. Um, but then you were an actor at mm -hmm. an undergrad. How did you, what made you decide to just go strict, straight? Yeah. Musical yeah. I, I think Cause are you, a, do you sing as well? I do. Yeah. Um, I would consider, I've always considered myself, uh, an actor first, mm -hmm. but I do sing. Mm -hmm. I was singing at Disneyland, okay. you know, so, yeah, yeah. um, <laughs> but it's not, um, some people are singers first. Mm -hmm. That's not how I came to the work. Okay. I came to the work as a dancer and an actor. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, uh, I mean, primarily, I mean, as a performer, I did a lot of all the things, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it wasn't strictly musical theater, but as a director, it's been primarily musical theater for me. Mm -hmm. And the reason is um, I really like big shows. Mm -hmm. I like to be challenged. I like a lot of moving pieces. Um, I think the choreographer in me um, lends itself towards that, but I tend to be able to visualize 
how a really big show can function. Mm -hmm. um, and I really like working with a lot of collaborators. And when you work on musicals, you get more collaborators mm -hmm. usually in the room. So even though I'm a choreographer, I don't always do my own choreography. It depends on the project. Because mm -hmm. um, there are styles that I'm really good in and there are styles that I, I could get get the job done but somebody else would be better mm -hmm. and if I feel like somebody else would be better and there's an option to hire somebody else I'd rather work with someone else because I like the collaborative um, conversations mm -hmm. I like to work with other people so that's actually why I do musicals is because I tend to have a lot more challenges and problems mm -hmm. to solve and there's usually just more bodies right. in the room to collaborate with yeah um, yeah, yeah. So that's, I think that's why that's happened. And even when I direct plays, they tend to move like musicals. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> there are plays that move like musicals. I yeah. was just talking this morning with my students about um, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was choreographed by Stephen Hoggett, who's one mm -hmm. of my favorite choreographers working right now. Mm -hmm. And he, his work on that is spectacular. Yeah. It's not a musical, but it moves yeah, like a musical. Yeah, something like Peter and the Starcatcher yeah. would be something like that Big, as well. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to have music in it, but mm -hmm. just the way it moves is... is yeah, the way the show would... Yeah, yeah. The move, yeah, so the... Yeah, things that take a lot of um, creative bandwidth, I yeah. think. Yeah, it's big ensemble... Yes. Ensemble-based yeah. mm -hmm. uh, shows. Yeah, yeah. The, the more bodies, the better. Cool, cool. So, uh, pick, so to piggyback off of that, since you mentioned it, as far as collaborating with uh, choreographers and everyone else in the room, you just recently wrapped SpongeBob the musical here at the school, mm -hmm. um, and we were actually just talking about it in class, um, and we were talking about like, like what are the parameters in like when you are directing a musical uh, compared to like a regular play because musical you gotta worry about music you gotta worry about the dancing plus mm -hmm. the acting and like the story the arc of the show and stuff like that how do you approach it or what is your thoughts on when it's like a big show like a, like a spongebob where there's a reference like a broadway reference mm -hmm. um in in terms of for educational purposes of directing and stuff like that how do you approach or pick and choose whether you're gonna try to take what's necessary from those shows mm -hmm. to incorporate in your show versus doing other things to for to educate like the designers of the student you know to help the yeah. student designers and stuff like that yeah like how because I'm sure it's different being professional di mm -hmm. prof professionally directing versus educationally directing but still you have that parameter of like the Broadway yeah um, set like the Broadway uh -huh. um placeholder like, yeah so. i think it's interesting because they they actually went back in during the pandemic and filmed and created the pro shot mm -hmm. of the spongebob musical so they didn't mm -hmm. do it while the show was running on broadway but okay. they did it afterwards and i think it's for me it was interesting now that we're living in the age of the pro shot mm -hmm. to do a musical that there's a pro shot of mm -hmm. i don't i don't know that i've done a musical that there's a pro shot of there's okay. always a bootleg somebody's mm -hmm. always put a bootleg of something on the internet right um which is wild. Mm -hmm. But I do think in any show, if it's not an original, like, new project, mm -hmm. I think we have to think about how the original was constructed, at the very least, to understand, like, the piece that you have in front of you, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. I think um, I'm a big fan of reinventing the wheel sometimes, and mm -hmm. I especially like to do that right now with older shows, mm -hmm. things that we've seen a million times. Like, what do I have to say that can freshen this up? Is there a way to deconstruct this? Right. Um, that will help us see it in a different way. With the SpongeBob musical, A, you've got the... The cartoon mm -hmm. that you have to navigate right mm -hmm. and you also have this pro shot that exists and is out in the world and is really easily accessible right. which is really awesome mm -hmm. um and so w when do you honor the original when do you flip it on its head you know a lot of that has to do with budget a lot of that has to do with um time for time yeah. yeah especially here yeah because i i can admit i i'm assuming doing a show here compared to like a uh, on Broadway or off Broadway mm -hmm. show so cutting like super small probably like a lot less time you have here compared yeah. to like off yeah yeah absolutely it. i think um once we did our pickup rehearsal i think we had 40 rehearsal blocks mm -hmm. for the show and that included like music rehearsals mm -hmm. 
um, and tech. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, one of the things that I start with is I work backwards. I start at the end of the calendar and I work backwards and I see how many days I have to stage the thing. Mm -hmm. Like that's the very first thing that I will do. And then I will set aside like one of my gifts as a director is actually scheduling a process mm -hmm. and understanding how we're going to get to Z. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I know and then I know the challenges of the show. So I make sure I leave myself time for those really challenging spots and for things to like not go well. So that's one of the first things I do is I work backwards um, and I figure out how I'm going to lay out the process. Then as I go through the design process, I'm really thinking about the challenges of the production, the mm -hmm. things that the script asks you to do. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of those in the SpongeBob musical based mm -hmm. on the original production. Mm -hmm. um, and some of those things we didn't have the budget or the time or the resources to achieve the way that they did. So you go back in and you figure out the nugget of why that happens. And then how can we do that in a way that would be delightful and sit inside of the world that we've created? Mm -hmm. um, so that's that that has that was actually one of the most fun parts of the process is figuring mm -hmm. out how to navigate what they did with millions and millions of dollars on a university budget, right? Yeah. Um, at a time too when university budgets are tight, mm -hmm. um, we have this gigantic musical, and I think we were pretty successful in figuring out new ways to do things. Mm -hmm. um, there's all these sequences in Act Two in particular that are exceptionally challenging. Mm -hmm. um, there's this Mount Humongous. Mm -hmm. There's these, these like Mount Humongous climbs, yeah. and we are not able to. We don't have any flying capabilities at the moment here. Mm -hmm. We can't fly actors. Mm -hmm. We have a fly system, and there was a bunch of like stuff in the fly system, mm -hmm. but we weren't able to like fly actors. So we had to keep them um, below a certain height mm -hmm. on stage. So we had all of these like units that we could like lock together and move and twist and turn and mm -hmm. figure out how the mountain was shifting around them. And we went back to Nickelodeon actually to figure that out. Okay. I was thinking about that show in the, that I grew up with in the nineties called, um, guts, mm -hmm. which was do like, a, yeah, do you have it? Yeah. Do you? <laughs> Uh, I was thinking about like the aggro crag and stuff oh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and that's that led us to like play kids play equipment mm -hmm. and that's what led to the design um, and we figured out how to construct the show um, in a different way without automation and mm -hmm. without millions of dollars and and uh, in a way that felt like it still was in the spirit mm -hmm. the spirit of the original without emulating the original right yeah. And how do you determine or like, is it just like on a case by case basis as far as like how similar or different you can and will make a musical compared to like the original? Yeah, I think it depends on who's on the creative team. Mm -hmm. Who do you know? Because oftentimes, too, you can get permission to use a lot of the original. Mm -hmm. Um if you if you were like closely tied to it, mm -hmm. I had quite a few friends that were part of that original mm -hmm. production. Um, so it's also helpful because you can ask questions about how things were created in mm -hmm. the first place, because um, that whole show was devised. It was a devised oh, yeah, 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 musical. Yeah, 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 it was yeah. devised in the room, that, yeah, yeah. Um, and we took a lot of that spirit of play as mm -hmm. well. Um, and I, as a director, even in the rehearsal room, I'm someone who likes to like, I come in with a plan because I know how the show has to function. Mm -hmm. Um, but then I, I use that as a like framework, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's like building the sandbox. Mm -hmm. Here's the, here are the parameters of the sandbox in this moment. Mm -hmm. And the actors get the parameters, but inside of that, they get an enormous amount of space to play okay. inside of the sandbox. If that yeah, makes yeah, any yeah, sense. Yeah. Um, so the actors would come in and really get to play. And the more time we spent with it, the more they played. Mm -hmm. um, because yeah. they understood the the shape mm -hmm. and where they had freedom to like right. so you're, explore. So you're big on actor agency, just giving yeah. them permission to- Yeah, I trust to actors. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I, I, you know, there have been moments in my career where I've had to like spoon feed actors because mm -hmm. at some point, especially with certain shows, like something has to happen at this exact moment and right. you know like and so i'll go beat by beat but i think as an educator my job is to give them the sandbox and to let them play mm -hmm. and then to say hey this is really exciting i'm really interested in what you're creating in this moment chase that yeah. um i love this idea but it's not working here try it here mm -hmm. um things like that um and to give them space to fail mm -hmm. yeah. and and to be caught right. safely right yeah. um inside of the rehearsal room when the stakes are low 
um, so that then they can get on stage and trust their show, which I think is evident in what we made, mm -hmm. is that they had an enormous amount of freedom to play mm -hmm. inside of the parameters of what we made. So how do you um, combat that with someone who wants more direction or wants to yeah i typically to um <laughs> if i if i can sense that from an actor um i'll chat with them very specifically they typically ask more questions mm -hmm. if they if they need more direction right yeah um and i mean yeah that's yeah. A, it's, it's, it's it's a slip it's a slippery slope because you you know some people like to be told certain things yeah. and, and like others like to be able to explore and it's yeah. like trying to find a balance but like also to you hear the thing like if they're not saying anything to you then keep doing you what keep you're doing going. yeah, yeah like, that's exactly it so. and um and i try also like because i i approach every process differently as mm -hmm. well right mm -hmm. so um this fall i directed a reimagined um into the woods mm -hmm. um and i was like in every thought, every idea, every phrase with them, like really coaching minutia in mm -hmm. a lot of ways because that show needs it. Mm -hmm. um, this one needs a spirit of play and wonder and exploration. Yeah. So I tried to create space for that inside of it. But I also would chat with actors when I knew I wasn't giving them like specific notes all the time and be like, I'm really, I just would be, I would say like, Hey, I trust you. I'm excited about where you're going. So you're not getting notes on this stuff. I want you to keep playing, mm -hmm. you know, but if you have like a spot that you need to chat with me about, tell me. Right. Right. Because otherwise I'm giving, I'm letting you play, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so on average, on like an average musical yeah. direct, when you're directing, what is the um, what's the primary things that need to be hit? Like, is it focusing more on the music, choreography? The all acting, the things. All of them. All, all the things. Gotta... Yeah. I'm a big fan of pre-production. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of pre-production because I think it's important for the collaborative relationships that everyone feels like they have a voice mm -hmm. and that we walk into the room with a plan. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you don't have, there's just not enough time. It's an economy of time. Right. Time is money and we don't ever have enough, yes. you know? Um, so I'm a huge fan of pre-production because I think it sets the collaborative relationships early. Mm -hmm. Um, especially if you're working with a new team that you haven't worked with before. Mm -hmm. Um, that wasn't the case on the SpongeBob musical. Um, but we did an enormous amount of pre-production. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that happens is I go in actually, and I go through the show many, many times. And I start thinking about what it needs, what the big issues with it are, what are the challenges, what are the themes, um, and how is this thing going to function, mm -hmm. right? I knew SpongeBob has, a, it's, it's written like a cartoon. So there's tiny, short little scenes. Mm -hmm. It bounces back and forth a lot. So I knew that we needed to be able to move quickly and mm -hmm. that it needed to feel seamless and cinematic. Mm -hmm. So that already informs the scenic design mm -hmm. before we even get started, right? Like right. we're already thinking about um, scenic design because I, I don't know where it's going. I just know it needs to do these things for me. Mm -hmm. And I know it needs to be able to move fast and it needs to be moved by actors because we don't have time in our tech process mm -hmm. to coach stagehands through that many shifts mm -hmm. in character yeah. in real time. And, and is that why th is, has, because of that, has that, informed your approach on giving the actors more agency yeah. and choice like trusting mm -hmm. them more yeah because you don't have time to to, to yeah. like foster and like nurture them like yeah you wouldn't necessarily maybe on like a play like a uh, a play that's not mm -hmm. a musical yeah so exactly yeah. we don't get to live in scenes for that long right, right? Yeah. you know and it's in a in a typical staging night mm -hmm. you're setting um a couple of scenes right there were nights where i would set like five or six short scenes mm -hmm. in a night and I would give, you know, like come in with a framework, mm -hmm. play as much as we possibly can, but then send them away to be like, okay, bring it back. Mm -hmm. um, because I knew the speed that we needed to move at um, to get that thing done on time. And I had to build all of the transitions in the rehearsal room because I knew we didn't have time to do it on stage. Mm -hmm. So like we had stand-ins for every single piece and I would make the actors move them and spin them and rotate them <laughs> and shift them. Um, and the only things we didn't do were Mount Humongous because mm -hmm. um, I knew that that would be wasted time in the room and I gave us a whole night on stage to do that. So you're anticipating from the beginning. Then you're 
working with your collaborators too to understand musically what's happening especially if you're used to just like listening to a cast recording there's mm -hmm. always a whole ton of extra music that is in the show there's reprises that don't make cast recordings there's underscore there's transition music there's all of this stuff so you want to make sure that you understand what's there and then often the songs are edited so dance breaks are cut down mm -hmm. you don't have if on a cast recording you don't have the full version even the pro shot of spongebob doesn't have the full version it's cut Mm -hmm. It's trimmed. It's shortened for TV. Mm -hmm. So there's a bunch of music that you need to make sure that you know and understand how it functions, where it lives. Um, then you're working with your choreographer, unless you are the choreographer, um, but you're thinking through why each dance piece happens, right? So that it's not just dance for dance sake, but also right. like it's tied to the storytelling. Yeah. Um, so you're, you're working on what needs to happen in that. And then if they have any specific needs, the show had like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of props <laughs> that we had to anticipate yeah. as much as possible Plus too. Plus the follies. You know, yeah. The noises, we had all uh, of the Foley sounds Foley's and mean. most of those are not prescribed in the script. So those came up in the rehearsal process, okay. which is a really fun, um, which was, I was terrified of it and it was so much fun. Yeah. We got started and I was like, oh yeah, we need this sound here. We yeah. need this sound here. And I felt like I had freedom that I had not had before mm -hmm. to figure out where those things lived because we were creating them in the room because mm -hmm. I wouldn't have had time to do that in tech. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and so we would send the list of like, we need these extra sounds to our sound designer and he would pull it if it was like a MIDI file mm -hmm. or if we were actually doing, because we did some of it live with instruments and stuff and we did some of it um, with MIDI files. So uh, figuring all of that out as we were going through the process and knowing that I have young actors who need time to review. Mm -hmm. We have to go back and we have to clean. We have to go back and we have to put chunks of the show together. Mm -hmm. You know, you build you build your process and you give yourself as much extra time as you can to fix the things that don't go right in the first place. But I mean, that's the reality, right? Is you're a bit of an air traffic controller yeah. at some point with yeah. all of these <laughs> people. But I love that. I love that. And I also was I'm, very fortunate to have a cast who I trusted. Yeah, I'm good with just being the passenger, doing my thing. Uh huh. Do the work on your or, stuff. Or the yeah. Pilot, you know, but um. Yeah. So if it if wasn't challenging enough, um, you, you we got hit with the pandemic. So yeah. Compared to prior when you were directing musicals to pr 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 <laughs> directing them in a pandemic. Yeah. You want want to talk about that as far as challenges yeah. and then even stuff that you found out that actually became a positive through that experience from yeah. the, like, from pre pandemic mm -hmm. to post or during and post pandemic. Yeah. Um I think in terms of process I think we're thinking more critically now just as an industry about like rehearsal schedules and mm -hmm. um, the impact that they have on people's lives. You know, I know that um, not being in production in the same way for a couple of years made me realize how, especially in like the university system, we, Crazy. I teach all day. Years. <laughs> I know I teach. I mean, I, I directed, I produced four films last year instead yeah. of directing a musical on stage. So um, thinking, you know, having essentially two and a half years between like huge musicals for me, mm -hmm. I directed some other projects and I directed some other musicals, but like really big ones. Mm -hmm. The last one I did was Pippin in the fall of 2019, uh, which is a very big musical. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, what I've been realized is the kind of toll that teaching all day and then going into rehearsal at night has on me mm -hmm. as an artist. Mm -hmm. Um, it's challenge. It's really, it's hard. I'm working 14 or 15 hour days because I love what I do. Mm -hmm. And I never forget that. I'm very thankful for that. But like, how can we be mindful of actors time? I've always been fairly mindful of actors time. I'm not somebody I I'm really good at planning a process. So I will not call you to come and sit in my room unless it's absolutely necessary. Right? right. Like occasionally there are times where I will say, I need you all here and I'm sorry, you're going to sit and wait to so bring something, mm -hmm. but that is not how I run a process. Right. I'm like, I have this amount of time to do this thing mm -hmm. and I'm going to get it done mm -hmm. in this amount of time. And then I'm on to the next thing and actors have very specific calls for when they're there. Cause I don't like to waste their right. time yeah. and they're students too, right? They have homework to do. They need to eat. They need some of them work, you know, like I, I 
they yeah. have they have lives and i think we're a little bit more mindful of that coming out of mm-hmm. uh, not out of we're still in it i can yeah. tell you that um still navigating yeah. uh very much covid so there's that um for me i've actually been thinking it gave me a lot of space to think about why we go to the theater Mm -hmm. why we would go to the theater instead of watch a film right Mm -hmm. and for me coming out of the pandemic i'm interested in theater that knows it's theater does that make sense i'm not interested in theater that's a poor man's version of a film Mm -hmm. does that make sense i want to celebrate the experience of an audience Mm -hmm. right and a cast and what that relationship is Mm -hmm. i don't want my audience to sit have to sit politely and observe like they're not there right which was evident in the spongebob music it was actually evident in um pippin Mm -hmm. even two and a half years ago but i think what i've figured out is that i like theater that requires the audience to participate well yeah that makes sense yes that does because we were actually talking about that a little bit in class in regards to like how some er some actors um will perform the same way every time even mm-hmm. when they're getting different reactions from the crowd and stuff mm-hmm. like that or they'll like be influenced but um where you have other actors they'll take for well, uh, for example Seth who plays Perch, mm-hmm. Perch yeah. Perkins he was talking about this he was saying um you know based on whatever the crowd was giving him that's mm-hmm. how it would interact like that's how it would in in um what's the word I'm thinking? influence in, influence yes mm-hmm. influence his reactions on how he was going to play with the audience and tell them about you know the mm-hmm. end of the world coming in bikini bottom pretty yeah much. so and he did yeah. such a great job of still maintaining the like consistency of the show mm-hmm. right. and the timings of the show and playing inside of the like framework mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right yeah and yeah. then you have like other st- st- other instances where like something might fall or something and like actors just don't pay attention to it yeah and it's like you're like it's there it's we like, can see it, it. Yeah, you need you, to acknowledge if this was it real, if you're in, yeah if you're in yeah. life you would pick it up so like yeah so yeah i understand that like for allowing the audience to interact and yeah um, to be part of the storytelling to. but yeah. also too it could be an issue too for some some actors i know um even myself at um before um, when you like know someone's in the audience or if you're not getting specific laughs on something that you got laughs on before then you're like oh well am I not doing like you start getting in your yeah. head and stuff like that and then that throws off actors as well but it's just like yeah being it's flexible. challenging yeah it's you challenging flexible you gotta be flexible open. and you you have to acknowledge too that not every audience is the same right right um we had particularly rowdy audiences mm-hmm. yes. um which was so fun <laughs> yeah um for this show but it was interesting to watch the actors um have to navigate that mm-hmm. and i actually stayed more engaged after opening than i normally would because i really mm-hmm. try with my students especially in, in when I'm directing in academia, I try to give them as close to a real life experience as possible mm-hmm. in terms of my, and I set very clear expectations for their preparation mm-hmm. um, and for the way that they engage in the room and then the way that they engage through process. Because I think that's part of what we do here is teach, is we're, we're preparing them to head out into the world, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and for us building a new musical theater program, like we expect that many of them will probably end up on national tours mm-hmm. and, and in Broadway shows if that's what they want to be doing with their lives. Um, is, so, that, is that something do you guys think about? Or like when you're creating like the curriculum stuff? Like, like Yeah, we, we are. Want, we're like thinking you want, about... You want your students. To... Well, I mean, not everyone wants to, right. to do that. And I mean, we have to realize too that in college we're mm-hmm. recruiting... 17 and 18 year olds Mm -hmm. at at 17 and 18 like i mean i was particularly focused and single-minded and um but i think i was probably the exception Mm -hmm. you know you should be figuring some stuff out 17 and 18 years old and so and we are asking them to decide what they want to do for the rest of their lives and the reality is is maybe you do get a degree in performance and decide to do something else or yeah. you know I have a couple students right now that we've recruited into this program who are um, gonna be great directors mm-hmm. or producers yeah you know or you know <laughs> would be great stage managers mm-hmm. or, or I've discovered that maybe what they want to do is swing on Broadway mm-hmm. instead of 
You know, they want to do something different every day. Right. They've got the skills to track that many people at once, and they figure that out here. And so there are other pathways into the profession, but also at the end of the day, I think what our goal is is to turn out the best humans <laughs> that yes. we can, yeah. you know? And there's a lot of learning to navigate interpersonal relationships that happens in college. Our our musical theater program is particularly rigorous. Their days are very full yeah. and they're figuring out how to feed themselves and do laundry and um, be a human being and get their homework in on time mm -hmm. and be off book for 17 different classes all at once. And um, sometimes it's hard. But I think what they learn from that are things that they'll take with them into the rest of their life, whatever they decide is right for them. Mm -hmm. um, so my hope is that if they want those careers, if they want to be a Broadway performer, that we've adequately prepared them for that and that they have the tools necessary to go into the industry and work. And I, I believe that, that we are doing that um, and that our students are we're very excited about their growth um, and about where they're headed, but also we hope that they know at the end of the day that if they decide that this isn't for them, that we will cheer them on in whatever they decide to do because we think that they'll be great collaborators, um, they'll be creative, and that they'll go forward with integrity and so wherever they end up, you know, yeah. life is wild. Yeah. And the twists and turns it takes are wild. I never could have told you that it's set at 17 years old that I would be here. Yeah. You know, Same. in North Carolina, <laughs> um, building a musical theater program, and I wouldn't change it for the world. And how has it been um, building a program as opposed to being in a program already established? Yeah. I think, um, I mean, that's what made the job so attractive to yeah. me, actually. Yeah. Um, I'm very fortunate to have gone to two amazing institutions um, that have top five musical theater programs mm -hmm. and um, well I did a BFA acting degree at the University of Michigan I was not in the musical theater program there but I was very fortunate to be mentored by several of the musical theater faculty mm -hmm. who knew that I was already directing musicals um, I had a lot of opportunities that I sought out in undergrad and I always made the ask mm -hmm. and whenever possible people would say yes you know they would let me into a class or into a room or um, give me opportunities to create. Um, so I'm very thankful for that. And I learned a lot both at the University of Michigan and at Penn State about how these programs are built. Mm -hmm. um, and they're kind of, they're like truly two of the top, they're in the top yeah. five every year. They're amazing musical theater programs. Um, and so what I got to do when I got here was to reimagine um, what that process might look like um, at this institution, um, and it, and with my personal values, which are, um, training great actors, mm -hmm. that our musical theater performers would be great actors, yeah. like the best in the business, right? Because mm -hmm. the reality is, too, is you're going out in the world, and you don't know where things are going to hit for right. you, right. right? Like, and you need to do film. Mm -hmm. yeah. You need to you, there, you don't know what opportunities are coming. You need right. to be able to handle Shakespeare. You need to be able to do these things. So it was a really kind of incredible to get to think about my values and the kinds of performers that we would like to be known for here. Mm -hmm. And to look at this institution, too, which has like such a legacy of incredible actors, right? In the MFA programs the BFA programs, the BA drama, like we've got some amazing performers that have come out of this school mm -hmm. who are really incredible actors. So for us, I think we wanted to build a musical theater program for the 21st century that responds to the demands on a contemporary musical theater performer. The days mm -hmm. are gone where you just dance in the chorus for your whole life, right? right like yeah. you got to be a great you actor. Gotta be well rounded. Yeah, well you gotta and you gotta be able to have something to say for yourself and mm -hmm. um, ideas, and to be a contributor in the room, um, which is also part of why <laughs> I go with such a light hand with my actors is mm -hmm. because I want them to create. Right. Yeah. 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 I really mm -hmm. want them to have to create, and I want them to think critically about 
the arc of the story. And if I spoon feed that to them, then they don't own it in the same way. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, I want them to have ownership over their work. Mm-hmm. And they do. Yeah. But some processes I get to really dig in and some processes I get to air traffic control. And mm-hmm. I'm fortunate that I had a great cast on this yeah. one who I could trust to create inside of the parameters I set up. So, so in your over every day directing and teaching yeah. career, what are you, what do you, what do you, what's the most, what's your most fulfilling parts of those positions and the most challenging? I yeah. Guess, kind of. Um, you know, it's interesting. I love to be challenged. Mm-hmm which is why I like big shows. We talked about that. Mm -hmm. Um, But I really enjoy teaching. Mm -hmm. I love to teach. Um, And I really enjoy... Which you did mention earlier, too. Yeah. You like like the fostering of the... the Yeah, of the the talent. Yeah, Yeah. and of the... Just, I think it's interesting to figure out what tools a student already has at their disposal. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think it would be a big secret for me to say that I'm not interested in teaching foundational technique I, I can do it there are people who are really good at teaching foundational performance technique um, I can do it that's not where I'm best right like mm-hmm. I'm at my best when I get to like take what you already have and help shape it mm-hmm. right and to help expand your set of tools and to challenge you into doing things that I don't think that you thought you could ever accomplish like that is that is the most rewarding part of what we do um, I have loved being able to develop a program and roll it out. We'll go to full enrollment next fall. Nice. Our first, we'll have, it'll, for the first time, we'll have four full classes here. Um, and our first, like, full graduating class. We have two graduates of our program this year, but the first, like, full class will graduate next year, which is really exciting. Um, that's been amazing. Um, I love the collaborative relationships that I get to have with my colleagues here. I have some amazing colleagues that I get to work with every day who I'm very thankful for. And I am um, delighted. Yeah, that's, that's, that's why I do what I do. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, in any academic institution, there's also an enormous amount of other work that comes with that. Mm-hmm. Um, I do a lot of advising. Mm-hmm. I enjoy advising, actually, mm-hmm. but I advise from a perspective of what the students' future goals are mm-hmm. as opposed to what their goals for the semester are, right? So right. we look at the whole picture before we look at the the semester, mm-hmm. the coming semester, because I want to make sure that we're keeping their end goals in mind. Mm-hmm. And if I need to shape, help them shape their like plans, then we can do that mm-hmm. to, to make sure that they get to take this extra thing that they're not required to take, but that is like really important to them or that we look for opportunities for them to do this or this before they graduate, things mm-hmm. like that. So I, I try to get to do that um, with my students as I advise. Um, but I mean, there's other stuff. Like there's just, mm-hmm. we all have responsibilities and yeah. committees and um, sometimes that's challenging, but that's part of the work of being in an academic institution mm-hmm. um, that these things have to happen. So there's that. Um, yeah. uh, and I don't mind it. I actually don't mind the meetings, but it can, it takes up a lot of time. Yeah. Um, and I have to often remind myself that I'm not here to do meetings. I'm here to teach. Mm. (laughs) Um, and that I, you know, I try to carve out time and prioritize, um, classes, but it's challenging sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So for those who may be listening and watching this and are interested in coming to UNCG oh. in musical theater, what, what do you look for um, when it comes to like auditions when you're recruiting um, yeah. students? Obviously, you have to know how to sing and dance somewhat. Yeah. <laughs> and have some experience in. Yeah. I mean, well, we're. Possibly. Yes. And we want you to be typically a student enters and they're like already really solid in an area, right? Mm-hmm. Or we know that they're ready, ripe to like grow in mm-hmm. that area. But we have, um, we've had some dancers who didn't really think they were singers come through the program, who are singers now. 
um, really great singers actually, but they kind of identified as dancers when they entered. Um, we've had singers who can dance now. Um, I, I think they wouldn't call themselves dancers yet, but they will be when they graduate. So you don't have to be a triple threat package. What we're looking for is that you know who you are, at least now, mm-hmm. right? Like we're looking at the individual. Um, we have really small classes, so we're thinking about the makeup of each class and then the total cohort too mm-hmm. of who we have at any given time, right? Um, we try not to have too many people who are exactly the same, same type, right? Um, because we want to make sure that they don't feel like they're a number, but that they're a person mm-hmm. um, here, um, that's, I mean, that's what we're, that's what we look for. We, we do an interview as part of the process and the interviews are actually really, really important for us. Mm-hmm. Um, the ones who really show up as themselves and the answers don't feel prepackaged. Mm-hmm. Those are the ones we're really interested in who are able to engage with us. Um, it's important to us. We have small classes. It's yeah. Yeah, we get a lot yeah, of one-on-one on one time. Tolerate, or not, not even tell you want to mm-hmm. be around people that you care. Yeah. That that are cool enough, at least. Well, <laughs> so, or just, yeah, just able to... a-holes. Yes. Well, there's this great story. Um, Sutton Foster, who's Broadway star, Broadway mm-hmm. legend. She's in The Music Man on Broadway right now. Um, there's this great story that I heard. She came to Penn State. It was before I got there. And one of the students asked, um, well, what's the secret to your success? Mm -hmm. And she basically said, don't be an a-hole. Because you'll get your first job based on your talent. Mm -hmm. The jobs after that, you're going to book because people like working with you. Mm -hmm. So how you show up is half of it. Mm -hmm. Are you showing up in the room prepared, engaged, and ready to play? Mm -hmm. Have you prepared what you've been asked to prepare? You know, like, are you doing your job? Mm -hmm. And then are you good to work with right right? and that doesn't mean that everybody has to be like a people person Mm -hmm. but are you hardworking? do you cause issues hopefully not you know do you get along well with the people that you work with and are you willing to like get in and laugh and have a good time and not take yourself too seriously right that's how you book your next job right and then the one after that and the one after that and the one after that because at a certain point everyone's talented right yeah right Mm -hmm. i mean it's even true in in a college program right like if you're here you're probably talented Mm -hmm. right yeah you've got talent so it's about what you do with that right and how you work with other people and how you engage um that says a lot about who you are as a human being and whether people want to work with you again yeah well said (laughs) (laughs) um so do you do any work outside of the class or do or, or I should say, well, are, do you want to do more work? Yeah, outside of class? I do. I mean, coming back, I had a bunch of contracts lined up pre pandemic that all kind of got, um, canceled or postponed and mm-hmm. things like that. Um, I'm actually taking this summer off. I need to do okay. some writing. Oh. Um, I did not take any contracts this summer. I didn't go looking for any. I didn't accept any. Now, when, um, you, when you do, is it performing or directing? Directing, okay. typically. Um, although I did some acting again yeah. this last year. Yeah. Mike Turek has dragged me back in I'm front of the say, camera. Like, are, like, are you, are you yeah. trying to cut that part off? Or no, I, I actually, uh, I've been talking and thinking very seriously about like starting to, to act again. Uh, what's hard for me is shutting off the part Don't of my brain you. that's in, the director. <laughs> yeah. Cause I'm so interested in what everybody else is doing. Mm-hmm. Like I got, I got to go work on this film with um, one of my colleagues who's just had such an incredible professional acting career. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, shake some dust off a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I had to really sit there and remind myself, like, you're not the director in this situation. Cause I was just so interested in what everybody else was doing. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you need to like, do your job. Your job is to show up and be the actor. So like get in your process and like, you know how to do this thing. But like I had to actually consciously like be like that. You can't, I know that's really interesting to you right now. You need to like (laughs) focus on what you're here for. Right. right? Um, because I've been focused on directing for, for so many years now. Um, but yeah, I'm kind of in the process of figuring out what's next. Um, there are a couple of, I mean, I'm at a place too right now where I really want to get in the rooms with some master directors who don't work in the same way that I do. Mm -hmm. Um, so I have a couple of people that I, um, am 
making connections with right now who are directors that I really admire that I'd like to assist mm -hmm. um, on some big projects and get inside of their rooms and watch them work. Mm -hmm. um, I have a lot of interest in new musicals. Um, Do you see yourself directing plays anymore? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would love to if the project came, if the right project came along. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any specific projects like that you would like to work on? Ah, some dream projects. Yeah. Um, because yeah. I know you said you said you're interested in new plays or new musicals now, but like yeah, from the like, do you have any dream roles and like or dream? Production. Dream yeah, productions, right. projects that I want to get my hands on. I get my hands on Rock of Ages next year, which has been like a bucket list one for a while. Nice. I just really want to laugh right now. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just, I want to laugh right now. I, um, I want to do things that make us laugh. Um, but uh, actually, I have been hankering and hungry to get my hands on a Shakespeare play. Shakespeare is like real close to musical theater, though. Like mm -hmm. they're big. They, you mm -hmm. right. know, there's yeah, a lot yeah. of people. There's a lot of moving parts. Well, you you helped on. Did you help on As You Like It? Or? I was the faculty advisor okay. on As You Like yeah, It. Yeah. 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 Um, so I'm I'm hungry to get my hands on some Shakespeare. At the moment, I teach Shakespeare, but I haven't directed any. I haven't directed any full shows, but I would really love to do that and to dive in and um, deal with language. So. I would love to do that, um, specifically because I'm really just in comedy mode right now, coming mm -hmm. coming out of pandemic lands. I just yeah. really want to laugh. Um, so I would love to get my hands on some of those comedies. Um, and then there are some older musicals that I really am excited to think about and reimagine that I would like to get my hands on as well, mm -hmm. to see what they have to say or if they need to go on the shelf for a while. Some of them are too problematic to be fixed. <laughs> yeah. um, and some of them, I think the nugget is there and it just needs to be reimagined. Um, that's what, what a lot of my grad, grad thesis work was on, actually, was on um, how we can take a fresh look, I think, at the way we've written women in particular. Um, yeah, especially in 20th century musicals. Like, yeah. how can we flesh them out and give them more agency yeah so these are these are some of my interests things that i'm looking at and i actually uh I, you know i got to direct some films last year i went to film school for a little bit um so one of the things that i actually want to sit down and start one of the things that i'm planning to write this summer is mm -hmm. i want to write a short okay. um nice, nice. for myself yeah yeah um speaking on on that with um the writing like as far as you said um reimagining things as far, as far as characters for women and stuff like that being a, a woman a woman director mm -hmm. in musical theater or just in theater in general it's that's very um rare as well isn't it it's, i mean it's, yeah. getting, it's getting better mm -hmm. but there's yeah, a lot of us yeah, coming yeah but it's this still... whole next my generation mm -hmm. there's a lot of us yeah um how important like, you want to talk about like how important that is to have yeah. that, that um that yeah i mean representation matters right, right? Yeah. like and i knew that i could do it because i saw susan shulman and susan stroman mm -hmm. and kathleen marshall doing it mm -hmm. right helming these gigantic musicals and i thought well if if they can do it then there's space for me mm -hmm. um i've been very fortunate to have a lot of really wonderful mentors and um to not really hit the glass ceiling as much as some of my peers in the generation ahead of me mm -hmm. even um but uh the reality is is that it's hard it's harder to be a female director yeah. um it's harder to get the first opportunity at a new company i think mm -hmm. um i i mm, yeah it's challenging yeah yeah it's challenging um, I've always gotten Challenging all of my work necessary. from people that I've already worked with. Oh, yeah. It's just like what I said about Seth yeah. Foster. Don't be yeah. an a-hole. Like, yeah. show up and do your work, and then the next job will come. Yeah. So a lot of my opportunities have come from, as a director, have come from me as an actor. Yeah. Working as an actor and, and people being like, oh, you do that. Mm -hmm. Or I get a choreography job because I'm, those are, from those have always been easier for me to get mm -hmm. than for the, somebody to trust you with the full show. Yeah. Do you, right. Do you still do chore choreography? I do occasionally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if it's the right project, mm -hmm. I'll do it. Um, if it's the right project, but I also, like I said, I like to, 
I often direct these days, so I like to work with a choreographer if they're going to do a better job than I would on the show. Right. I also, it, um, speaking of air traffic controller and like how much time you have, um, as a choreographer, and if I'm directing as well, I always have to have a great assistant. Mm -hmm. I have to have a great associate, actually, not an assistant, and a great associate director. Mm -hmm. um, because, or a, or a really great associate choreographer, because I need to set this thing and then I need to take that choreographer's hat back off. I got to put that director hat right back on so I don't mm -hmm. get lost in the small things and I can keep the macro, the, the big picture frame of mind because when I'm in it's like it's literally like switching hats mm -hmm. um I don't I'm not able to wear those two hats at the same point same time so I always have to have a great great assistant um if I'm choreographing and directing or a couple of great assistants is even <laughs> yes. better the more um the I, and I put them to work yeah. right many hands make light work yeah I do I put them to work I keep them busy um which is why I Use people that I trust. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Build all about building relationships and mm -hmm. yeah, keeping those relationships strong. So they'll yeah. hire. Yeah. Because if you noticed, like in most movies and stuff, they're always usually the same actors in certain movies. It's because people like to hire their friends opposed yeah. to somebody they don't know or think or they hear is not mm -hmm. the best to work with. So yeah. it's always something and, to keep in mind. We check up on people. Mm -hmm. We we may, I get phone calls. Yeah. I get phone calls all the time. Um, a, I'm, I'm looking for somebody for this project, or B, I see that you worked with this person. What are they like? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you want to, yeah. And, and when you get the shot, when you get your chance to work, to get in a room that you want to be in and to work on a project that you want to be on, that is your actual audition for more work, is, mm -hmm. the, is the work you do in the room. So. Yeah, yeah we were just talking about this Um when Wesley came and then I was talking to Flannery too the other day about it as far as like the audition is a, a skill in itself it's it's the work mm -hmm. more than getting the job more than having the job I should say you're putting in more work doing that because you gotta get hired first and yeah. then you can relax a little bit and actually have fun and do the job that you yeah. were hired to do um, and each job is your audition for your next yeah yeah so to piggyback off of that, yeah. Any if, if for future directors of musical theater or mm -hmm. teachers of musical theater um, or acting um, or just life advice, what would mm -hmm. you what would you give someone if they asked you? Ooh, yeah. I mean, if somebody want wanted to do this, what I do, mm -hmm. I would say, um, learn from as many people as you can. Mm -hmm. um, learn all the things a lot of what i do is collaborate with designers mm -hmm. um i'm very thankful i was at i transferred to the university of michigan so the school that i was at before that um had a really wonderful tech uh tech program mm -hmm. and i had to i was required to take all those classes mm -hmm. and i'm a terrible sound designer i'm a terrible sound designer but i understand at least what they're doing mm -hmm. You know, so you hope that you can communicate. Same, like I was a terrible lighting designer, mm -hmm. but I have enough tools now that I can communicate with a lighting designer about what I need mm -hmm. without being prescriptive, right? Without saying, do this thing for me. You know, I need something that feels like this, um, you know, or, you know, the moment when you, when the light, when the look is like this, this is actually what I'm looking for. Can we, you know, um, figuring out how to communicate with people and understand and appreciate their process is important. So like, you got to do all the things, especially director. Yeah. You need to take all the things. You need mm -hmm. to study all the things. I used to run wardrobe crew for money. Mm -hmm. Um, that was like one of my survival jobs when I was in college was I would, when I wasn't in something or directing something, I would run wardrobe crew for pay. Um, nice. and it changes the way you think about the work and the community and all of the people who work on your projects too. So do, do all the things. But, um, the other thing that I would say is, um, the other things that make you a human being that are not directly tied to your art are important. You need to have a life yes. because if you don't have a life, you don't have anything to say. You don't have anything to say in your art, right? You got to have, you got to have a full life. 
Um, and then two other things. One is things are going to play out exactly the way they should and you can trust timing. Yeah. And then the last thing, I, sorry, I to tag on to that, I spent a lot of time pounding on doors that wouldn't open for me in my early 20s. Mm -hmm. And instead, what I needed to do was go through the doors that were opening for me. And fortunately, I at least figured that out, right? You know, yeah. I still kept pounding on some of those right. doors, yeah. but even while I was doing that, I moved through other ones. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the, the journey that I took by going through the doors that I didn't expect to open mm -hmm. that has actually like made me the artist that I am today. And I, ultimately, when I circled back to those closed doors, after taking this journey, they just swung open for me. I didn't even have to knock. They just were like, here you go. Yeah. You know, um, so trust, trust your journey. Um, know that it's probably not going to be linear. We all hear those success stories of people who graduate from college and immediately like book their first Broadway show or their first feature film. And, mm -hmm. and you know, the rest is history, mm -hmm. but those are the exception, yeah. right? For every one of those, there's thousands of people out there grinding it out. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. And even in those situations, those people that get success early, you don't hear about it, but more times than not, after that one shot, they're not doing much after, you mm -hmm. know, for a long period of time until they get their next thing. Mm -hmm. Or they might even have had challenges within getting that break, the first yeah. break. So, yeah, you never know. Yeah. But. Well, and it's important to, to be able to keep yourself creatively fulfilled, yeah. right? Yeah. In those lean times. Yeah. Um, but don't expect that that's going to happen and be prepared to buckle down and, and grind hard, right? And don't be afraid to produce your own stuff, right? If somebody isn't giving you the opportunities, then go make it for yourself, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I mean, we're, we're living in an age where creating content is relatively affordable, much more so than it was when I graduated from college. And that wasn't that long ago. Yeah. You know, it just gets more and more affordable to have great equipment now. So yes. make your own work right? or do something that creatively fulfills you, you know, do a podcast so you can talk to people about making art, right? Like that's so cool. Art is life. Art is life. <laughs> it is, but you got to have a life to make good art. So right. go have a life Yes, be, that is be fulfilling to you. Yes. Got to be human in mm -hmm. order to be an actor. Yeah. Go where you're celebrated, not where you're tolerated. And if there's no room for you at the table, make your own table. I love that. So <laughs> I love that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. There's been a lot of table making. Yes. Yes, for yeah. sure. So um, since you brought it up, art being life. Yeah. <laughs> what is art in life to you? What does that mean to you? Oh, and how important is it to you? Yeah. I think art and life. <laughs> um, I mean, Art is my heartbeat, right? Like yeah. I've been making since I could draw breath. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not so much about the quality of what you make, but that you make it from here, right? Because mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I told you the story about me booking my first job and not knowing what I was doing, but mm -hmm. not knowing enough to know that I didn't know what I was doing. Right, yeah. But what I was doing was trusting myself and working from my heart mm -hmm. and there's something really beautiful in that yeah you know so yeah maybe i didn't have all this the tools that i have now and i hope in 20 years i've got way more tools in my toolbox than i do currently right mm -hmm. at almost 40. um i would hope that i would be 10 times the director that i am right now in in another 20 years yeah um but i think art is about bringing yourself to the work mm -hmm. and trusting that that's enough but I also think it's in looking at the beauty around you, too, and mm -hmm. acknowledging what that is. Yeah. You know, I spent yesterday with my um, my partner who, you know, has patiently been waiting for this show to be over. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we spent the day together and, uh, you know, just to get not doing a whole lot just together. Yeah. Right. And just that's that's like and, filling yeah. your cup. Right. Like. I can pour into other people because I've spent time with someone who's so important to me. Mm -hmm. um, and that's art too. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, Natalie, who I had on, mm -hmm. um, she was saying like pretty much 
art is any in everything you do in life just even in your everyday life of because how much time do you like switch on different masks i guess or different yeah. personalities depending on who you're around stuff like that and then that's an art in itself yeah. too trying to navigate certain situations and, yeah um but yeah just like yeah. giving taking you know just like just mm -hmm. being open negotiating and, yeah, yeah yeah negotiating relationships and and adapting to different situations and code switching too. Yeah, You're doing yeah, a lot of code switching. Yeah. I definitely, I felt like that when I was in grad school. Actually, mm -hmm. I was like, yeah. wait, what hat am I wearing right yeah. now? Because yeah. I had like a lot of faculty like responsibilities, mm -hmm. but then I would get in trouble for making a choice, and I was like, well. I right. thought that I was empowered to do that. Yeah. And they're like, no, you're a student now. And I'm like, oh, I got to switch to my student hat. <laughs> and then you'd be in your student hat and they'd be like, why didn't you do this? And you're like, wow, you know, yeah. and that's, I feel like that's the universal like grad student yeah. um, language, right? Yeah. Is that you're, you're like part faculty and part student and you're constantly code switching and yeah. navigating uh, and, and adapting to different teaching styles and personalities and all the things. Yeah. It's wild. Yes. It's a wild life. Yeah. Yeah. It feels like I've, you live so you feel like life is so short but long at the same time like when you look back on your life you see like yeah how much stuff you actually already done it's yeah like, oh, i've lived so many lives already yeah. and I'm not even halfway <laughs> <laughs> and here i am yeah. wow that's it yeah Still trying to figure out stuff <laughs> it feels like yesterday and 17 years ago all at once yeah, right for i real. mean i yeah. told you guys that we took two years off and i lived on a ranch in wyoming best thing i ever did yeah I cleaned cabins and I assisted the chef and I gardened. Did you watch? Did you watch the show Yellowstone? I haven't watched oh, it. Okay, no. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's pretty good. I've heard it's yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was gonna ask like if you. <laughs> mm -mm, I haven't had a chance to watch it yet. Um, yeah. But yeah, like living that life for two years actually filled my cup in some really interesting ways. I was super burned out. Mm -hmm. You know, trying to make ends meet, being an artist, living in L.A., you know, yeah. like I had 17 different jobs and I was running from one thing to the next all the time. And yeah. um, it was such a gift. And I thought it would derail me. And instead, it like liberated me, yeah. I think. And it gave me a chance to figure out who I was if I wasn't the artist. Yeah. Because I am the artist. Right. Yeah. You're going to be an artist. Is yeah. Be regardless. Um, it's just you know how do you fill your time with other things until mm -hmm. you can do that art again um and yeah like another thing about that as far as like you were saying like the worlds are not linear um mm -hmm. i saw something i believe winston duke said it or, or at least he posted it uh -huh. <laughs> and, uh, it was talking about like just because you had to, i'm paraphrasing at this point but it was like just because you you've had alternate detours to your destination that you thought you were on doesn't mean that you're not still on the right path to getting to that destination right. so right and that's something definitely that i um think about and like take into consideration because of my journey and career path on mm -hmm. to getting this getting to this point yeah. in life so and then and then patients i think as you figure out your next steps yeah. too, right? And just like, enjoying the project, yeah, trusting mm -hmm. the project, enjoying it while you're there. Cause yeah. so much of my time being young, like younger is like, I could just think about like all the time I was sleepwalking more, more yeah. time. I wasn't present in life. I was just going by. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the biggest challenges. I'm such a like planner mm -hmm. and maker that I'm always thinking 17 steps ahead. Right. And I have to remind myself to like be where my feet are. Yeah. Be where your feet are. Be with the person that's in front of you. Yeah. Like just take it every um, hour at a time. <laughs> yeah, you don't need to fix that right now. That will fix itself. Yeah. You need to deal with. You right. need to be in this moment, or else you're never here. Yeah. Because and even now, it's sometimes hard. I catch myself getting distracted. Like I'll be looking at yeah. looking for something, and then I get distracted by something else, and I'm like, oh. And then then I end up closing out the the thing I opened. And, huh. and then I was like, oh, I didn't even do yeah. the thing that I was I to... open. Like, I didn't even do what I was supposed yeah. to do because I got distracted. But, yeah, it is, it's a work in progress for it sure. It is a work in progress. Well, aren't we all a work in progress? <laughs> yes. I, I mean, we are not done until we leave this planet, right? Pretty much, yeah. You know? Um, and then after that, who knows? We probably still yeah. probably got to do more work doing something <gasps> who else. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, who knows? Um, but, yeah, I think... I think it can be easy as an artist to lose track 
of what's so great in the here and now because you're always thinking ahead. Yeah, and then like you're always planning and you're always watching other people hustling succeeding and, yes. on social media. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think you know we need to figure out how to celebrate that for each other, mm-hmm. you know, and to yeah. to celebrate those wins and to not allow it to affect our um, sense of self-worth, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, if that opportunity hasn't been coming for you right now. Because also, like, we always forget that that is a highlight reel, right? right. Yeah. You don't see the struggles, the daily, yeah. you know, like, I do this thing sometimes on Mondays. Sometimes I'm really good about it. Sometimes it's, you know, where I just, like, pop up and I post whatever, or, I, like, I talk about whatever I'm working through for myself because I just think some, somebody's got to speak truth into a world that's, like, right. a... a showcase you know yeah that's like here's my best highlights and it's like i get i do that too sometimes i'm like i'm doing this great thing Mm -hmm. but this is such an awesome moment and that's what we share out but we forget too that like most of our lives are not those moments it's the moments in between that and i think it's important to say like hey i'm struggling with this today so here's you know how i'm navigating this if it's helpful to you yeah so maybe in i always do it in the hopes that it will help somebody feel less alone, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and inevitably, I hear from someone that was like, I needed that those words today. And it's a different person every time, yeah. which is why I keep doing it. Right. You know, not right. because I need the world to know that I'm a terrible person who struggles all the time and, right. you know, is yeah. anxious and moody and you know yeah. <laughs> not because I need to share that but because I think it helps people realize that they're not alone and I think often my life can look like a highlight reel if I don't do that mm-hmm. you know yeah yeah I should I'm, I should just start a, a page strictly for ne- not negative but like fails the, the, the fails or, the, or like or, just the boring moments yeah. of life <laughs> or just yeah just this getting um, the days that you're riding the struggle bus or yeah. being dragged by it right like, yeah um you know, because there's a lot of truth there. Yeah. There's a lot of truth there, too. There's a lot of life there. Yeah. And art is definitely life. And we make art about the hard stuff, <laughs> don't we? <laughs> yes. Even comedies, right, are about, it's like... all, like, yeah, the dark Things stuff. that have gone wrong. Mm-hmm. It's right? finding the, the humor in it, finding mm-hmm. the light in it. Yeah. Yeah. That's what makes it the best. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Aaron, I appreciate your time. It's um, been so fun. I have one, two questions left. Okay. Uh... The first question is more so just uh, where can we find you and follow you on your journey, or do you yeah. have any like social media or things that we should be keeping an eye out on in yeah. the future? Because I know you said you don't know exactly what's next for you right now because you you're taking a break for the summer, which is great, um, and this probably won't be out till the summer anyway yeah. <laughs> or close to it. So yeah, so, I'm yeah. taking some creative time. I'm taking some downtime for me to recharge and figure yeah. out. And uh, the truth is. Sorry, we're way long right now, and I talk too much. But the truth is, is, like, uh, a couple years ago, I hit some of, like, my really, really big life goals, and they all happened at the Mm -hmm. same time. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I gave myself a little bit of time to enjoy that Mm -hmm. and to kind of be where my feet were. Um, And then the pandemic came. So now I'm in a place of uh, setting some new big goals, and Mm -hmm. I need some downtime to do that, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what this, this summer is about is about figuring out what I want next because there are a lot of things that I can be doing next Mm -hmm. but I don't want to do them unless they're in alignment with who I am now right Mm -hmm. and I'm not the same person I was two years ago right I've learned a lot Mm -hmm. about what's important to me so what's I that's what I want to do is make sure that those big goals are in alignment with what I want and not just the things that I've always said I wanted. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, so that's that's what I'll be working on. But you can find me working through that because um, I'm sure it will pop up on my uh, social media channels. The best place for me is on Instagram because I'm a elder millennial and we like Instagram. Um, so that's at Aaron Farrell Spear. So E R I N F A R R E L L. S P E E R. That's the best place to keep tabs on me. Cool, cool. What else you got? Um, well, for those who are interested in the program of musical theater yeah. and, and auditioning and stuff like that, where would it just go to the? Yeah, musicaltheater.uncg.edu, and it's theater T H E A T R E. 
musicaltheater.uncg.edu. We'll take you to our landing page with information about the program, how to audition for us. Um, audition season is really the fall for pre-screens. Um, and by the time we get to January, we're in just like we've done all of our callbacks and we're we're in that point. So if it's something that's of interest to you. Um, oh, so you guys are early with Yeah, it. we are. We have to be <laughs> uh, because of the pre-screen process yeah. and how um, wild uh, and busy musical theater audition seasons are. Um, these kids are auditioning everywhere. So the pre-screen, is that like the interview and the application process? Yeah, it's the, so it's the... They, they submit to us, they submit two self-tapes, mm -hmm. two song self-tapes, a monologue self-tape, a dance video, and a wild card. We ask for a wild card. And if you're doing it's that... Like a special skill. Yeah, well, yeah, a special skill or a personality, mm -hmm. right? Like, we don't really want your wild card to be something else musical theater. Uh, we want it to be a chance for us to get to know who else you are. Like, we saw this kid on rollerblades, like, playing lacrosse. And I was like, oh, interesting. Okay, I feel like I know a little bit about them. Yeah. Or like we just, or sometimes we get videos of, of you know, students with their friends, mm -hmm. you know, like doing silly things. Mm -hmm. um, and we get a really good sense of who they are as a person. Or we have people who are artists and they give us time lapses of their art and talk about how they make it, you know. But we're, you know, we're trying to get a sense of who they are right. in addition to like where they're at in terms of their training and talent. You know, yeah, we don't yeah. want you to come to us ready we want you to come to us ready to keep working and growing, um, but we're we're gauging potential and possibilities. And if they're a student that we think we can serve, mm -hmm. you know, because not every program is right for every person. So, but that starts early. So pre-screens open in August. Mm. So um, and they close January fifteenth. Yeah. Well, so I'll yeah, make, definitely make sure it definitely will be out before August. So yeah, for those who are interested, yeah. you can apply. Yes. Yeah. If you're interested in applying, cool. Musicaltheater.uncg.edu. Cool. Yes. Well, thank you, Aaron. Yeah. Yeah. Final question. When it's all said and done, what would you like your legacy to look like? There's a, one of my favorite writers is uh, Annie Lamott. Um, she, she, she's, yeah, one of my favorites. Um, she's an essayist. She writes about her life. Um, and I feel very seen when I read her stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but she has this quote that says... Um, that what she wants on her gravestone is that she was a helper and that she danced. Um, and I don't mean like danced professionally, but like I think danced in terms of chose to step on the floor, mm -hmm. you know, engaged, put themselves at risk, you know, mm -hmm. risked looking foolish yeah. to move to the music inside of them. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope at the end of my life, that feels about right for me, that I was a helper, that I was known for helping people, um, and that I danced, you know, that I was brave and that I stepped into the arena, right? Yeah. Um, I don't care if I got battered in the arena. Mm -hmm. I care that I did it. I don't want to live my life on the sidelines. I want to get in the, in the fray. Yeah. Um, so I, and that's all you can ask for at the end of the day, I think, or yeah. all I can ask for at the end of the day. Yeah. You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Exactly. So why not go and take them? Exactly. Be bold. Right. Yeah. Appreciate it, Aaron. I appreciate That's a you, great Russell. great answer. It was so, uh, so fun to get to chat with you. Yes. Sorry I talk a lot, y'all. Oh, no. It was perfect, actually. It, was, it made it even better. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you, guys. Hope you enjoyed this lovely episode, and I appreciate your journey along the way with me during this time. Um, so without further ado... Until next time, peace, love, and blessings.